Okay, he continues in verse 5. In verses 5 and 6, what we see is a continuation of this idea of making an accurate assessment of life. And he goes into a couple of different aspects. So in verse 5 he says, As long as there is capability to earn wealth, so long would there be a retinue. Later, when he lives with infirm body, none would heed him at home. So if you remember the title of this text, Bajagovindan, means seek the eternal. Seek the self within. Again, that's good advice. But what's going to actually motivate us to seek the inner self? We may cognitively accept, I should be seeking my inner self. But that's not necessarily going to give us a sustained practice or a sustained search for an inner self. What we've got to find is a motivating reason to do it. One of the things that can motivate us to seek the self is to recognize the limitations of everything else. Think about somebody who wants to quit smoking. On the one side, they think about it'd be nice to be physically healthier. They're thinking about the positive side of it. But another powerful way to motivate giving up smoking is to think about the limitations of it. So when you see the limitations of something, that can inspire you to move away from it. So what are the limitations of the world? Well, this verse goes into one of it. As long as you can earn wealth, you'll have retinue. You'll have people following you. Later on, when your capacity to earn has dropped, you'll find that the retinue also vanishes. None would heed him at home. He's sick, old, and all those people who were following him around while he was young, healthy, and earning wealth, nowhere to be found. It's the nature of humans. Not all humans in all situations, but this is part of our makeup. So what this is talking about is an extrinsic motivation. If we are expecting something like wealth to generate happiness, we have to understand the limitation of it to do that. An extrinsic motivation is something that depends upon external factors for you to gain the enjoyment. So think of it this way. You put in your time and your effort to gain wealth. So the wealth is separate from the activity itself. The working doesn't gain you wealth. The wealth is separate. It comes as a result after the fact. Not only that, but it depends upon factors outside of your control to get that result. People have to buy your product or reward you with the money. It requires the actions and the choices of other people. So you are depending on others to get that monetary reward. So these are the two aspects of an extrinsic motivation. The capacity for extrinsic motivation is to give us a genuine sense of well-being is limited. But because we are caught up in our desires and because we don't have a clear-eyed evaluation of how the world works, we only see the good part around wealth. We don't see the cost that we incur by pursuing it. Not only that, but we don't see how the world will relate to us. So this whole idea of not seeing things as they are and having an exaggerated value for something like wealth is how the ego functions. A useful way of thinking about the definition of an ego is to think about what it does. And one of the things the ego does is that it inflates the value of the world beyond 
need. So making money is part of our normal healthy needs. What the ego does is it inflates the value of money making beyond need. So too with various forms of relationships. So too with physical beauty. So too with online popularity. It's not that these things have zero value. They do have some value. And they can help to fulfill a need. But while, for example, online popularity may fulfill our need for, uh, for connectedness, say 5%, we think it can fulfill our need for connectedness at 80%. And so we go grasping after something which has a small capacity to fulfill our needs or give us well-being and at the same time has a tremendous carrying cost because it's an extrinsic motivation. So what this verse is doing is showing us the limitations of our pursuits. You want to make a lot of money? Go ahead. But just ask the question, why are you doing it? Okay, on the one side it might be a sense of security. That's a genuine need. It might also be the fact that when I am earning a lot of wealth, there seem to be a lot of people around me. Okay, recognize that that solution for gaining retinue is temporary and fragile. Because if the retinue that you're getting is dependent on your capacity to earn wealth, then when your capacity to earn wealth diminishes, so too will the retinue. So if you have your own ego functioning, inflating the value of the world beyond need, then that's the kind of environment that you're creating in your life. You will naturally be falling in with people who have similar worldviews, inflating the value beyond need, functioning out of ego. And if the people around you that you've gathered in close to you are functioning on ego, then when their egos are not being satisfied, they'll drop you like a hot potato. And you can't blame them for doing it. I'm no longer serving their egoistic needs. Why would they continue to be around me? Why would they continue to follow me? So the antidote, if you like, to that is to go back to the first verse. The first verse is like a chorus. Okay, so what this is saying is that when you invest in these extrinsic motivations, these external gains, you're setting yourself up for future disappointment. Instead, seek the eternal. That is the wise use of your time. You do have genuine needs. Autonomy, relatedness, competence. It's your obligation to fulfill those. Use the world to fulfill those needs so that you have a genuine sense of well-being. But don't expect the world to deliver something it cannot. 